Hi, I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears featuring in-depth conversations with fascinating people from sport and politics, the arts, business and beyond. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day by talking to the people capturing the imagination of Australians right now. On today's episode, we speak to Australian writer and officially designated national living treasure, Tim Winton, about his campaign to save the remote, pristine ecosystems around Ningaloo in northwest Western Australia. The award-winning author has produced a documentary on the subject, currently airing on ABC iView, about the battle to protect this beautiful reef and the land that surrounds it from numerous threats, including salt mines, oil and gas pipelines, and a deep water port in the middle of a humpback whale refuge. And hosting this conversation about mangrove forests and wrestling dugongs and Winton's exhortation to us all to feel the panic, feel the rage and get active is Good Weekend senior writer Tim Elliott. Thanks, Conrad. And hi, Tim, and thanks for being here. Oh, pleasure. The doco is amazing. It's beautiful and it's beautifully shot. But for listeners who haven't been to Ningaloo, could you just explain where it is? What is it? I didn't know that there are three ecosystems that really make it up. So give us a little word picture of what it's like. Yeah, it's uh, quite a bit north of uh, Perth. It's in the on the Northwest Cape, which is this big peninsula that sticks out into the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's an arid zone. It has a quite a particular kind of desert maritime environment. So you've got this big peninsula, you've got a coral reef that uh, runs down the western side of it, that's Ningaloo Reef, and unlike the Great Barrier Reef, it's not 20 miles offshore, it's, you know, it's it's 20 metres offshore. In that's fact, incredible. It, so people yeah, can, so you can just walk out there. Yeah, and you can just wade into it. You can mm. kneel down, put your face, yeah. in, and you can see coral and you can see, you know, heaps of fish. And it's, that's about 300 kilometres long inshore. So, so it's the world's longest fringing coral reef. Backing up against that, behind it is this um, big spine of uh, dry ranges called the Cape Range. And they're just kind of rugged canyons and, and gullies and ancient reef terraces because there have been a number of Ningaloo reefs over the millions of years. And so you can just see these terraces where uh, you can walk um, through the bones of, of, of those coral reefs on, on Cape Range. Looks very dry, but underneath it's actually full of water and full of amazing and very rare and endangered uh, creatures uh, in the dark underground. On the other side of the Cape, I talk about this as you know, three toes of an emu's foot. Yeah. You know, these three interconnected uh, ecosystems. It's also important because the emu is the totem animal for the traditional owners. Exmouth Gulf, the third ecosystem, is a is massive. It's twenty six hundred square kilometres. It's the largest intact arid zone estuary in the world with these massive pristine mangrove forests. To give you a sense of how big that is, it's about 48 times the size of Sydney Harbour. Mm. It has twice as many fish species as uh, Ningaloo Reef, uh, incredible corals that nobody knows about that are heat resistant. And it's one of the biggest humpback whale refuges in the world and a big hotspot for sea snakes and dugongs and you know, you name it. So it's a kind of a wonderland. So they're, they're really, and the other important thing to know about Ningaloo in general, uh, if you get in the water, you'll be able to see more species of megafauna there in one day than anywhere else in the world, mm. including the Serengeti. So you're just talking about multiple various wild, big creatures that yeah. you can, you can have an encounter and uh, be in the water or on the water and still see the beach. Yeah. It's mind-blowing. Yeah, it's incredible. Tell me, what was your first interaction with the reef? When did you first become? I you know? went just after I published Cloud Street. So it was um, post-91, I guess. So it was 92, maybe, 93. Uh, I went fishing. Uh, somebody oh. dragged me up just to go. I, was wondering, I thought I was going out to catch a tuna. And the guy that took me, I think he set me up, really. Uh, his name was George King. He was a he was an old rascal. He's since died. But um, so I was out trolling for tuna, and he says, "Oh, Timmy, um, put your fins on. Get a mask and put your fins on. Put the rod down. You know, just get in the water." I'm like what? Yeah. He was really insistent, um, and I just <laughs> dropped everything, um, jumped in the water in my jocks, and 
I'm bailed out into 60 metres of water, so you can't see the bottom. It's purple. Mm. It's all spangly with um, plankton and all that. You know, it's like yeah. the little floating stars that are in the water. Yeah, and then really. out of the purple gloom, just see these dots and these dots are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> it's like, are these fish? What? Are, what are, yeah. They're getting bigger. And then suddenly I can see that these dots are – uh, on something, and it's yeah. just like the you know the Starship Enterprise coming out of the gloom. Um, the gloom, and this massive shark shows up, and I you know part of me is thinking, man, this is the biggest tiger shark I've ever seen in my life. But tiger sharks don't really have these spots. Yeah, you know? had the big blunt head of a tiger yeah. shark. So I swam with this thing. Uh, once my heart rate got down, I swam with it for about 15 minutes. There were two bronze whalers underneath it, um, just wow. sort of swimming around in circles, and that was that kept it interesting. Yeah. But um, so it was just this, you know, this massive animal, and then realizing there were others all around it. There's an aggregation here, you know. And then after that, I, w I went in after my, you know, floundered back to the boat with my mind blown. Then we went in shallow, and we swam in the coral gardens and. I think I realised that although I'd been in the water all my life and I thought I knew a lot about the ocean, I realised I'd been swimming in leftovers until that point. This is the first time I ever was in an ecosystem that was in such good health that it was still recognisable as an intact place. It had diversity and abundance and mm -hmm. it was just like – it was. But, you know, between that and these other places that I've been to, and I've swum in, in waters all over the world in both hemispheres, between them and Ningaloo, there's just lots yeah. of daylight, mm. you know. so That's it's a, what the, the amazing thing about the doco, incredible three-part doco that just was blooming away, just binged the whole thing, was the way that you make it really clear that it's every part of it, all those three toes of the emu are all interconnected, vital to one another. But also just the fascinating way you point out the interactions and symbiotic kind of relationships between these kooky animals like the fish that eat the parasites off the sharks and then yeah. there's, there's rat, the rats who imitate the other fish that look like you know, the, the sh bits of sharks and then They're the games. skin that comes yeah. off yeah. the whales when they beat each other up. And, yeah. And it's just games going on. There's relationships going on. There's stories and interconnections going on all the time. Yeah. You, you're kind of diving into a – or hiking through however you're experiencing, mm. you know, wallowing in the mud or whatever. All around you, there's just this kind of web of stuff going on that's pushing life forward and yeah. it's, it's all happening and you just don't notice it. Um, until you slow down long enough to see what's in front of your face, which is your classic postmodern dilemma, I think, yeah. our, our point in history. Yeah. There's so much going on and we've become so unskilled at noticing it because we're going so fast. Another thing that blew me away is the fact that there are still creatures there that haven't been, the, the sea snake that, that was been recently discovered and the sea snakes that are on the way out and the creatures that don't yeah. even – and this is happening everywhere, I guess, but creatures that are becoming extinct and haven't even been found yet or they've just been found and that are dying already because of what we're doing. Yeah, it's, it's, so in, in that sense it's just um, it's a work in progress and e even while we were making the show, stuff was being discovered and found out yeah. and so the data gaps are, are enormous. And one of the reasons to make the show was that this is a really pivotal point in Ningaloo's history, you know, really consequential decisions are being made this year and next year about its future. But decisions are being made in the absence of data, mm. and which is kind of crazy. So it was a, it was a way of um, us focusing on, on that natural evolution and this, and this kind of new knowledge that was coming out at the same time as this social change was, was happening because mm. we started talking about this in 2018 about but, this project. About this project, yeah. yeah. And it took 57 weeks to film. <laughs> yeah, just just the bit that we were shooting, yeah. yeah. The Indigenous Custodians only got native title over it yeah. in 2019. Yeah. So we were present and making the show while they were returning to country, yeah. coming back to places that they'd been scraped off for generations and coming back into the community and onto landscape with not just legal tenure but and not just moral authority but management authority they're joint managers of of the estate now mm. and to see that kind of cultural progress and, and be able to record it, it was just yeah it was a kind of a, a thrill and you were saying that okay so the key decisions going to be made this year and the next about 
uh, the future of the reef. So what's at stake and what decisions are going to be made? Yeah, the, the thing that a lot of people don't understand, if they know anything about Ningaloo at all, they, they, some people remember that 20 years ago, you know, we, we saved the reef, mm. quote unquote, and that was a multi-part community grassroots fight, really. Firstly, to stop a grizzly uh, marina resort development right in the middle of, um, of the reef at Coral Bay, um, and that took three years. But in doing so, we got to redraw the planning uh, regulations around that. We also got to enlarge the marine park, which was really significant. And then we got to enlarge the sanctuary zones within the marine park from a measly 9% um, to 34%. And that set it on the path to World Heritage, which we you know, subsequently got in 2011. So the Ningaloo Reef, the Cape Range, with its precious uh, troglofauna and stygofauna that living down there in the subterranean waterways, they were protected. Initially, UNESCO and the IUCN were completely on board and recognised that Exmouth Gulf clearly also had World Heritage values. They encouraged the Australian government to uh, include Exmouth Gulf in the World Heritage boundary. There was what's called the optimal boundary. All the science was for it. Everyone was in furious agreement. Mm. And then there was this white-handing campaign by certain industrial interests, um, change of government at various levels, and they carved Exmouth Gulf out of the uh, World Heritage listing. So who was responsible for that? Can you? Oh, look, I don't want to name names and shame the shameful, but... Um, Why? Uh, you know, the, 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 there was a pastoralist and graziers association. Yeah. There, were, there was a, the oil and gas industry. There was still a there was still an oil uh, and gas tenement smack dab in the middle of um, Exmouth Gulf. The local chamber of commerce was against it. In fact, the local chamber of commerce in Exmouth, uh, one of their... Prominent members flew to Paris to UNESCO to try to speak against World Heritage, not just for Exmouth Gulf, but for the reef and the range. So there was a kind of wow. there was a kind of redneck sort of insur Cabal. insurgency <laughs> uh, to try and stop it, because you know they want they wanted Ningaloo to be more like the Pilbara, you know, where you've got you know all that heavy industry, all the massive kind of um, deep water ports, the salt mining, the, mm. the you know you know, big industrial hubs. And uh, what Ningaloo is the, the exception to Northwest Australia in the sense that this is the last place that's not industrialised, that's not so modified as to be almost unrecognisable. Mm. And we wanted to keep it that way. And obviously the World Heritage um, Committee wanted to keep it that way. So, so what's so, at stake for the Gulf then? The, what does that moment, mean for the well, Gulf? Because the door's still open yeah. and, they, you know, it, it, it's never even been made a marine park, let alone um, mm. any heritage. So we've been fighting a campaign through a, uh, a campaign called Protect Ningaloo for the last five years. First, we fought off a, an oil and gas pipeline facility in the bottom of the Gulf. That took three years. A lot of blood and treasure. There's a deep water port being um, mooted for right in the middle, you know, a, a kilometre long wharf um, right in the middle of the, you know, the biggest humpback refuge what? Um, in the hemisphere. We, you know, and they want a big fuel dump and you know, to increase heavy shipping. And it's like an enormous servo for And this fish. is in the Gulf? Yeah, right, right in the, wow. you know, it's Ningaloo's nursery. Mm. So it's, it's mind boggling. And on the other side of the Gulf, uh, a German multinational wants to bulldoze hundreds of kilometres of these pristine wetlands to make a salt mine. They're just the immediate threats because of the lack of protection, the, the consequence of you know uh, certain industrial and political interests carving out um, the Gulf from the World Heritage Area because development, because you know, I guess. People had hopes to exploit this ecosystem in the same way that they have at Port Hedland or they have mm. at Caratha or Dampier. So the, the thinking behind it is just the old 19th century, 20th century thinking, this is just real estate to be carved up and turned into money. Yeah. Um, what it, what's there is just beside the point. Who cares? Yeah. Um, it's the nihilism of late-stage capitalism. Um, you know, capital works like this. It goes in search of cheap labour. It exploits it until it no longer becomes cheap. Then yeah. you move on to cheap labour elsewhere, which is what's happened in globalisation. Fossil capitalism is the apogee of that. You have you go in search of cheap labour and cheap nature, and you exploit them until it's 
it's exhausted and then you move on to somewhere else and find cheap labor and cheap nature and that model sadly is the you know the model of colonialization you arrive you seize you enclose you turn it into money and it's sort of the root cause of why we're in the shit now mm. it's just such short term thinking with no sense of consequence and no sense of care for those who come after us but isn't it fascinating? I mean, the people who are trying to make money out of the Gulf and all of these precious areas, do they not have children? Do they not have any um, sort of skerrick or instinct toward things of beauty and creatures of nature? And what, why are they different from us? <laughs> yeah, well, I, um, in a way, they're probably not different. It's just that they are hypnotised by a, a way of thinking that um, – you know, shareholders, money, now, 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 now. It's a form of nihilism, you know, that they've, they've drunk the Kool-Aid, you know. And you can think about that until you retire and then you'll have a few guilty years where you'll form yeah. a foundation and, 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 and disperse a few shekels to make yourself feel better. Meantime, you've built yourself a bunker yeah. because you know what's coming. Um, so in terms of the Gulf, they're the immediate physical threats um, as a result of a lack of protection. We managed, you know um, – in the last five years to encourage the West Australian government to, de to declare the Gulf a marine park and that's enormous progress. I mean, science, the scientists have been saying it should be a marine park since 2004. Mm. Uh, sorry, 1994. <laughs> um, so finally they caught up with the science with a little bit of encouragement mm. from us. Well, quite a lot of encouragement from us. I'm being very polite. <laughs> So the next, the next step for, for the Gulf is uh, national heritage and we're encouraging uh, the, the Federal Environment Minister, Plibersek, to um, see the, the sense in the science and to uh, give Exmouth Gulf national heritage. That sets it on the course to world heritage. You need these, you need these sort of Steps. protections to, to, to yeah. get there. Um, and that'll be great and that'll be a – a kind of an achievement, a generational achievement mm. on a par with what we achieved uh, in the last 20 years um, at Ningaloo. So f for me, that'll be tr great. That'll be 25 years work pro bono uh, on, our, on our parts that, you know, will make us feel great. The problem is we still have this broader existential threat that lots of people don't realise that this amazing, pristine, rare place is completely surrounded by the fossil fuel industry. I couldn't believe the map in the yeah. doco. Um, yeah. There's a map of the area with just these little um, flames, flames, pinpricks of flames where all the rigs are and stuff like and that. That's under, and that's underselling it. I mean, we just it's couldn't just do, all we around couldn't, the We area. couldn't put everything couldn't that was in there because there wouldn't be no room. It's yeah, unbelievable. We, I had no idea be, there was, it was that yeah. sort of I scale. mean, that's where, all the, that's where all the oil um, deposits are and all the gas is. And all, all those corporations who are paying so little tax and have been for so long and who are being grotesquely subsidised by, you know, national Us. governments, mm. um, we're paying for it. They're just scraping out the gas and, and the oil as hard as they can, while they can, while it's still legal, you know. Mm. I mean, what they're doing is legal, whether it's moral or not is another matter, but they're just trying to suck that stuff out at a, at a rate of knots and that's like a, just a carbon bomb, you know, mm. and, um, and just the irony of it happening right on the edge of the World Heritage Area. Yeah. And year after year, in the last 20 years, they just get closer and closer. So now that you can see the, f the rigs and the flares at night, from the yeah. pristine beaches of Ningaloo. And in, in a way, it's just a picture of where we are in history, not just at Ningaloo, but where we are in history at the moment. Everyone's trying to make progress. Everyone wants to, you know, get themselves unfucked from, uh, if you'll pardon my language, from, from fossil capital and yeah. find a new way in, in a renewable, sustainable future, while at the same time all these corporations are just – getting rich, particularly during, you know, this obscene period during war profiteering that they're mm. making during the, you know, Ukraine war, digging it up, piping it up as fast yeah. as they can, releasing, you know, mm. don't even talk about the carbon, the amount of methane that's being released into yeah. the atmosphere just by, just by um, uh, drilling and exploration is mind-blowing.
So how do you not get, I mean, just watching the doco, it's <laughs> beautiful it was, it's, uh, it's really sad. It's really confronting. It's confronting. It's stupid and it's enraging, you mm. know, but I, I think we have to look at that and I think it's, I think it's worth embracing the panic of that. You've got to allow yourself to feel the panic when, you, when you're confronted by how stupid some people are and how captive governments are to this really quite, you know, small sector of, of industry – their influence over our politicians is disproportionate. It's amazing, but mm. particularly when you consider how few people they employ compared to other industries. Yeah. It's, it's disproportionate. I think it's okay to feel um, a sense of panic and mm. rage, um, but then you've got to do something about it. Mm. Feel the panic, feel the rage, and get active. Otherwise, go home, dig a hole, and just pull the rug up over your, over your head. I think... The only thing that's going to make substantive change if, is if people stop being passive and stop accepting the kind of complacent nihilism that certain governments and lots of corporations want you to adopt. If you feel powerless, it works perfectly for them. Yeah. If you feel pissed off and you, and you get a bit militant and you start insisting on a different future for your children, because, mm. um, yeah, people say, why do you do it? I've got four grandkids. Yeah. You know, I look in their faces, mm. I, I, I sn- smell their hair, and I just think about what I've experienced, the bits that I've been able to show them of, of the world, and knowing that they're going to have children, and some of them will have children, and some of their children will have children, and the life is waiting for them, the level of immiseration mm. that's waiting if we don't do anything fast in this last decade of agency that we have, yeah. it just makes me determined, you know. Yeah. And I, I say in the show, you know, that hope's not an emotion. Hope is uh, something that we make. It's something mm. that, we, that we have to fabricate and pass on. Hope is determination. It's a determination yeah. not, to, not to give in. But the fact is great things have been done at Ningaloo, great choices have been made. Part of the reason that it's an incredible place to go to is that it's remote and it's this confluence of ge- geography that that makes it this incredible place. The other part that makes it rich and amazing is that people did some smart and difficult things 20 years ago mm. and 40 years ago so that it's, for instance, you know, in, in episode three there's this pretty confronting orca hunt in, mm. in Exmouth Gulf. That's an amazing natural event, mm. but it's a mistake to think of it as just a natural event. That's a political outcome. Mm. The only reason that there's orcas, tropical orcas, mind mm. you, coming down from the equatorial waters to hunt humpback whales in Exmouth Gulf, which is only now happening mm. for the first time in recent history, probably for 50 or 60 years, is that when I was 18 in 1978, Australians, you know, Australians made their government stop commercial whaling. Mm. And in, at that point, there were only 300 humpbacks yeah. left in the Western population. So that's the very, very brink of extinction. We pulled up right at the last minute. We put the, put the flame to the feet of Malcolm Fraser and bang, it, within a generation, there's thirty to 40,000 humpbacks in that population and the place is kicking off. So there's, there's, that's just one of a number of, uh, of instances. You know, the other reason that you can go to Ningaloo and see stuff is that 20 years ago we fought to, to stop people developing it and, and mm. you know, fishing, overfishing and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, you're not just seeing a natural event. You're seeing a political outcome. I just didn't want to make nature porn. I didn't want to make one of those BBC shows where you carve out nature from mm. the context of the rest of the world. You okay, take it so away from politics. Tell me why it's really, because in the you make a really great observation about how important and how rare it is for people to have an unmediated experience with nature. So why is it so important in this battle to have people go there and go, wow, and be blown away by nature? Well, I, th- I think we underestimate f- from the, the moment we get ejected from childhood, we get sort of de-skilled from things that we're naturally good at and that, we, and that we're naturally charged by. And that's sort of um, the, all this sensory stuff that, you know, when you're a kid, you're just a sensory sponge and your mind's being blown all the time. 
everything is wonderful, mm. you know, awesome, you know, and and then we, we get sort of desensitized as adults where we have to grow up and be, you know, and be sensible and get on with the real things. But when you reconnect with that sense of awe and you put yourself in a position where you're overwhelmed by something that's inexplicable, wonderful, you know, in terms of just there's so much going on that's so big, it's hard to understand, or it's just so weird looking. Um, it's sort of it's liberating, and it makes you it connect it connects you to your home. It reminds you you're, you're a creature. You're just one. Mm. You're one little fish in, in this big ocean on this on this blue dot that's you know whirring around in space. I mean, what's the odds of us even being here? You know. Yeah. And the dugong, um, yeah, that dugong yeah. <laughs> hunt you went on, and when you beautiful expression when you were saying, "Oh, you were," so you're hanging on to this because you had to go. I'll just explain. You guys had to go and basically wrestle a dugong in the water to tag it, and so that's not an easy thing to do, as you see in the doco. It's pretty freaking hard. Yeah. Um, and you were saying that when you were holding that dugong, which is a massive animal, and looking in its, you know anxious, beautiful, anxious eye and you feel its breath on your face and it's like, yeah, you're just a creature like me. Yeah, and if, and it's just a weird thing, you know, I, I really love dolphins and I, and I, and I love whales. It's been a, the, you know, cetaceans have been a lifelong obsession for me. But there's something different about a dugong. I don't know if it's just that it's got two nostrils like mm. us, you know, and it's and got mouth. a really weird looking face. I mean, yeah. it's a face that only a mother would love, let's yeah. be honest. But um. And it, but it's got, you know, and you can feel where its shoulders, these sort of vis, vestigial shoulders where mm. it used to have shoulders. And it's, um, yeah, it's got that sort of long human like body and it's breathing in your face, mm. you know, and it's, and it's looking at you and thinking, what the living hell? A minute ago, I was chomping on seagrass and I've got you strange, <laughs> you strange people. Cause you, you know, I had to give them a shave, a little, shave yeah, a little yeah, patch on the, on the back of them yeah. just to put the, the, the tag and the cameras and stuff on and take DNA and then sex it and, you know, yeah. don't, don't want to even talk, want to talk about yeah. that. But Another so, thing that absolutely was amazing was I didn't know that whales across the world can swap songs. Yeah, they so, pass it on. Yeah, so tell us about how there was um, some of the whale songs <laughs> were going all the way around the world to Reunion Island, Madagascar. Yeah, they, they, this, is a, this is an amazing thing. As, as the, they, those songs just go out from, you think they're just talking to one another in, in immediate vicinity, but um, they're talking over reasonable distances. But what, what happens is that they pass the song on, you know, because whales are at Ningaloo for quite a big chunk of the year. You know, I think of it as their home and, and the Antarctic as just their feeding ground where they go to visit, you know. But when they go back down into the ice, we, you know, they, the people who are studying uh, populations that go down directly below or south, south of Australia uh, and people are studying the ones that go across the Reunion Island and down uh, towards Africa, they, uh, they're, they're swapping songs. People are picking up, you know, people are doing acoustic studies and they're figuring out the songs of they've met down in the ice. There's a few, there's a few groups that have crossed over and they've passed on a tune. It's bizarre, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's just like an earworm. I love that harmony. It's an earworm. I love that harmony. Where's an, your, how'd you come up with that? <laughs> There's an earworm, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then, and then they start singing and then it comes back. Mm. And um, it's kind of lovely that even through the oceans, these animals are, are transmitting sort of memes in a way that um, – and they and they do have culture. This is what, mm. you know, you forget. Animals have culture. Mm. The orcas – at Ningaloo are called generalists, um, whereas orcas in other parts of the world have specific cultural dietary taboos. In, in, in the Pacific Northwest, some orca packs will only eat salmon, and if you capture them and try to feed them uh, a seal, they, they'll starve to death, and vice versa. Um, they have dietary taboos, whereas um, – in, in in Ningaloo, there's sort of uh, they'll, they're, they're across every buffet. On the all, yeah. yeah, so they're generalists, as they yeah, call them. Right. So um, there are some places in the world where you'd happily get in the water with uh, with with an orca, and mm. um, other and places you where you that. think mm, maybe not. Yeah, especially not when the water's turbid and you could be easily confused with a you know floundering newborn. Yeah, um, a humpback whale, you know. And, uh, yeah, the amount of beer I've been drinking, I could probably easily be confused with a floundering newborn humpback whale. Well, getting into that little hole the, when you were getting into the caves, um, that was heavy. I can't believe you 
managed to squeeze through that <laughs> tiny little tell people like that. Yeah, we, we I went down with Darren Brooks, who's a um, caver, speleologist, and um, he's personally uh, mapped at least 800 of uh, of the 900 big cast features, big uh, big caves under Kate Range. I mean, one of them you have to crawl for four kilometres, you know, 20 metres below ground, you know. And they pop up into water. To- yeah, so you mm. end up in the aquifer. So you end mm. up in the water table. So we went down um, one particular cave. We had to climb down this um, the roots of this ancient rock fig and um, we go down 20 metres into this not lovely big chamber and I'm thinking, oh, this looks cool, great. This, you know, this is a nice looking cave. And it's like, oh, this is not the cave, mate. This is the front doorstep. And I've got to go down this <laughs> tiny hole. You, you go down one shoulder at a time. So you got to do this weird thing where, you, you know, mm. and you just sort of wriggle, wriggle down. Really and, creepy. Yeah. And then Did we, you, fr- you seem very cool about it. Well, it's, it's You're kind not of. claustrophobic. Uh, yeah, I am a bit, um, mm. but the camera's running. So you just got to. Yeah. Pretend that you're okay with it, you know. Inside, you just like, yeah. <laughs> freckle was fibrillating, yeah. you know. Um, so we end up end up going right back down twenty meters uh, into the water table, and there's this nether world. There are these creatures that have never seen the light mm. since the dinosaurs, you know. Where in the old days, this desert maritime environment was covered in rainforest, you know, Gondwana, mm. and uh, and they've been down there ever since, and they've got no eyes, and it's like a zombie movie. Every, all these Big blind spiders and blind millipedes and blind um, scorpions. The scorpion's called Draculoides Bram Stokeri. Oh, no way. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my God. It's a, it's a whip scorpion and it's, all these things are wandering around trying yeah. to bump into each other. Um, they've got no eyes. And you get into the water part and there's this blind fish, blind cave, the blind gudgeon it's called. And then you pop up into that amazing little kind of like a – Beautiful oasis with this seawater in the middle of the desert, essentially. Yeah, well, that's yeah. at a diff- yeah, at a completely different place. You know, I'm I'm 15 or 20 kilometres inland in a in a middle of a salt mm. lake, and in the middle of a salt lake, there's oceanic fish, mm. and you swim down into a hole, and you can feel the cold ocean, the Indian Ocean, pressing through the limestone. Um, yeah, that was bizarre, and it's just it's a bizarre experience, and it's got mangroves. You yeah, know, and you know, mangroves are supposed to be at the Coastal. edge of the sea. Yeah. yeah, so you can be, you know, it, it, in the land and in the sea at the same time. You It'd know? be like having an island, you know, like a couple of k's off the coast, full of you know emus and yeah. camels and just, just <laughs> lions. Re- it's really, yeah. really like strange. What? So in that sense, it's just a series of of wonders, you know. Mm. And I, I um, over thirty years, I thought I knew quite a bit about Ningaloo, but, you know, having spent the last three or four years, you know, more or less completely on that, I mean, I was trying to write a novel at the same time, which is not an exercise I would recommend. It just meant, you know, having to get up because, you know, the the shoot days were long, so I'd just get up a couple of hours earlier. So if we had a six o'clock start, I'd have a four o'clock start. And uh, it was, I was doing doing my head in, you know, but, um, but yeah, it was, I learned so much. You know, mm. it was hard for me because then you know, I've spent forty years as a you know a sole trader. You know, a solo operator. I live in a room on my own with people who don't exist. You know, mm. they're the best kind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're the easiest ones to get along with. Yeah. And then I had to work in a, you know a crew. And then there's a kind of a committee element to um, filmmaking. There's certainly a committee element to natural history filmmaking. And what do you mean by that? Well, you know, if, if all these just you know, there's layers of decisions. It feels like you know, the Politburo has to send it to the you know, the Comintern, who has to, mm. you know, uh, run it through the dark chambers of the Lubyanka. Um, yeah. Um, so nothing's nothing's quite nothing's quite within your control at, at all times. So I'm normally you know the dictator of my own republic, and that was that was interesting, and also just you know physically working. And intellectually working with the core group of people trying to get this thing done against all the odds. 57 weeks. I couldn't believe when you told me that. (laughs) Just, um, it was a a long time. And we were doing it on, you know, on a modest uh, local budget. Nice thing about it was that we got some regional funds that meant that we were able to employ local people from the towns of Exmouth or Coral Bay, which are the only 
to, I mean, Exmouth is 2,800 people and Coral Bay is 350 people. So, mm. so <laughs> people got, people got trained and skilled in, you know, whether it was sound, drone, really? drone, drone oh, piloting, cool. yeah. cam, camera yeah. assistance. Um, and then again, another rare thing, you know, a production comes to town. Usually it's a, you know, a feature film that's six weeks come to town suck the juice out of a place and then move on and leave you know i mean you know accommodation providers and the pubs are happy and then it's gone um this show meant that we left a kind of a legacy of people who'd been upskilled and then people had gone on and shot for disney and really? uh, bbc oh, wow. and silverback and 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 that's been that's been great um yeah so we had a screening uh, the first ever screening uh, was in Exmouth for the local community. We showed the whole first episode. All the traditional owners were there. It was really emotional, a lovely. You know, Darren was in the – Darren Brooks, the speleologist, was in the in the second row. All these people who were in the show, a lot of scientists. It was lovely. It was a kind of really emotional um, thing and it gave people a sense of ownership that this was – you know, because people who live there are really, really proud of, of, of that place. Mm. You pay a premium to live a, in a place that remote. Everything's expensive. Mm. Every single thing in your life has to come up, you know, 12 or 14 hours on a road train. You know, and it's hot and it can be difficult. Um, but people are there because it's special, you know. And most people who are there are just so grateful every day. They wake up and you just look out and think, far out, look at that. If the wind's blowing in the wrong direction for the reef, we go to the Gulf. Mm. If it's cold, we just go hiking in the canyons and, find, you know, find something weird, fossils and, you know, rock wallabies and yeah. eagles and, yeah, you know, the bird life's incredible. I'd always love I, – I would love to go there. I've been on – I've been to England on surf trips, mm. but I, I haven't – I'd love to send my kids there. But, I, I mean, how accessible is it to see that stuff? It's, I mean, pretty yeah. well, you know, if you've got a mask and a snorkel, you know, you're going to see a lot of stuff just mm. in, in, the, in the first 50 metres offshore. Mm. You know, I went to go fishing and so I wasn't looking at anything. I was just, you know, I, I want to get a tuna, I want to get some giant trevally, I mm. well, could see a coral trout, blah, blah, blah. So I, I was just, I was extracting, yeah. you know, and when yeah. you, when you, and a lot of surfers, I mean, I'm, you know, I go there and surf a lot too, but you go there and you're just looking to get suck waves out of the place, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's but terrible. if you actually go if yeah. you actually go as a human creature yeah. and notice where you are, mm. you, you you never run out of things to um to, to look at and find. There's always an there's always an amazing walk. There's always a creek to go mm. up and um and there's just you know some kooky people to meet too. So at one point you say, Tim, that the reef is always on the edge and it's ready to blow your mind or break your heart. And I thought that was a lovely way to put it. So is it breaking your heart or is it constantly blowing your mind or both? So how do you reconcile what's going on? Uh, well, well, both. But, um, you know, I think we, we, we made the show to show what's there and what's at stake. Um, people said, oh, don't you feel bad about, you know, exposing your big secret to, to the world? And at one level I'm uncomfortable about that, but then I also know that, in Australia, and particularly in Northern Australia and in Northwestern Australia, lots of dark deeds get done in the twilight, just over the horizon. And I asked myself if Jook and Gorge uh, in the Pilbara had been famous five years ago, would Rio Tinto have blown the shit out of it just as a matter of course to make money out of it? And I think the answer is no. And I think if if Ningaloo, the three ecosystems of Ningaloo, come to the uh, to the world attention because this is you know the show's going global it elevates its status people know about it people get curious about it they treasure it you you lift its status and that becomes impossible for these great vandals to uh to think that they're going to be able to come in and knock it over um without a fight so yeah i, I wanted to elevate the status i wanted to celebrate it and make it untouchable whether that's whether that's achievable or not I don't know, but I, th I I think it gives it a better chance of getting better protection than it had before. Yeah, well, it's a stunning, stunning piece of work. So thanks for coming in and talking to us about it. Oh, pleasure. Thank you. Good Weekend Talks is brought to you by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Subscriptions power our newsrooms. 
To support independent journalism, search Subscribe Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, rate and comment wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Chi Wong. Technical assistance from Julia Carr Katzel. Editing from Conrad Marshall. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. And Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend.